Hey everyone, hope you're having an awesome day. This video is a follow-up to my top 10 tips for keeping and breeding Sulawesi shrimps, specifically the Sulawesi denarelli or Caradina denarelli. I'm a big believer that if you get up one more time than you fall, then you'll be successful. I hope these top 10 tips on where I majorly messed up and killed a lot of Sulawesi shrimp will help you and you'll avoid having unnecessary deaths. I'll start with a little bit of a background. As of, uh, as of June 2018, I currently have three colonies of Sulawesi shrimps. One tank is specifically for Sulawesi cardinals and I'm setting up another 10 gallon for them within the next few months. I got the Sulawesi bug back in around 2007 when they were first introduced and came onto the scene. I forgot where I ordered from, it was somewhere in the states and I got about 15 of them, they were wild caught. They did quite well and uh, we didn't have as much remineralizers, powdered food, and items like that uh, back then. Uh, they did breed for me and they were doing quite well and I got bored of them and uh, unfortunately or fortunately gave the colony away to my friend. My second attempt was fast forward to 2014 where I bit the bug again where I was doing some more research and there were a lot of new products like Salty Shrimp and Bactra AE. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't do too well that time and I did kill a lot of them and uh, with this new knowledge and I was pretty sad about it and I finally sat down and thought about it, what I did and figured out uh, on my third attempt which is uh, started in 2017 and now it's uh, 2018 June and I have over 250 in my Sulawesi Cardinal Colony. Throughout my journey, here are some of the top 10 major screw-ups and I hope they'll help you with keeping and breeding these awesome, colorful, and fascinating shrimp. Uh, on the side note, these are my personal opinions and tips that worked for me and there are tons of other breeders who do it differently and personally I think it's just try to find what works for you and enjoy the journey. Major screw-up number 10, buying too few. As I mentioned in my other video, these guys do much better in a larger group. I purchased less than 5 at one time and they were not happy at all. They all started to die off one by one. So my recommendation is to get at least a, a group of at least 15 to 25 to start off. And from my experience, they seem to feel more comfortable and safer in these numbers and they will follow each other while they're eating and uh, grazing on the algae. Screw up number nine, uh, the remineralizer salty shrimp uh, 7.5 versus 8.5. So the product salty shrimp has two types of Sulawesi remineralizers. They have the 7.5 version and the 8.5 version. The 8.5 version is a bit of a pain to dissolve and I put it in a bucket of RODI water and with a power head for seven days to dissolve it. Some people boil it, some people microwave it, there's different methods. The 7.5 dissolves super fast, but I find the Sulawesi Salty Shrimp 8.5 brings the pH to around 8.1, which mimics their natural habitat in their lakes. The Salty Shrimp 7.5 brings the pH to around 7.1, and I find that a little bit too low compared to their natural habitat. Some people argue that shrimps can adapt like uh, Neocaridinas, and they can survive from a pH of 6 to 8.5, but uh, I do find the Sulawesi shrimp to be a little bit more sensitive. I've had much more success using salty shrimp 8.5 versus 7.5 and that's from my personal experience and I'll continue using 8.5. There are other brands, for example, Bruno Wild and Shrimp King for Sulawesi salts. I personally haven't tried them and uh, and I can't really comment on them, but I'll also provide a link to the water parameters of the natural lakes of the Sulawesi shrimps by species, and that'll help you determine uh, which salts you'd like to use. Screw up number eight, the temperature. In their natural lakes, the Sulawesi shrimps require a higher water temperature of 82 to 84 Fahrenheit or 28 to 29 Celsius. I'd recommend getting a good heater that can bring up the temperature and I personally, I try to, with my sons, check the temperature of my Sulawesi tanks and all my tanks daily. I personally use and recommend uh, Eheim heaters. Uh, they've been very great for me. Other shrimp like Caradina and Neos don't require heaters, but the Sulawesi shrimps do need the heat. 
Uh, long story short was I recently lost power to my house and the temperature of the tanks dropped from to about 87 or sorry 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius this was for about five hours the shrimps were okay and there was no deaths I really believe that any longer they would have been stressed and might have died afterwards also you can argue that they do travel for 24 or 36 hours so that might stress them out also so the key thing is make sure you do check your temperature and keep the temperature up uh, in the range that they like screw up number seven uh, too many plants. This one's a controversial topic. Um, from what I know, the plants use up CO2 and can cause the pH to swing uh, between day and night. Uh, you want as much as stable parameters as possible. And from the YouTube videos I've seen of the Sulawesi lakes, it's mostly rocks. Uh, there are some plants though, uh, but it's mostly rocks. Uh, some debates I've had with other with other people are caradina shrimps come from rivers and streams with leaf litter and lots of people keep them with plants in aquariums and they adapt perfectly fine. Uh, I personally don't have plants in my Sulawesi tanks but I do have algae on the rocks and on the substrate. Some people might argue that the algae might cause the pH to swing between day and night but I'm guessing it doesn't swing as much as uh, having lots of plants. Screw up number six, wild caught versus home bred. So personally, I have kept and I have bred wild caught ones, but uh, honestly, if you're starting out, home bred ones are more likely, most likely to be easier to keep and breed. The stress of the shipment, adapting to a few aquariums with wild ones um, might be quite stressful there. I noticed that the wild ones seem to be more territorial and they're a little bit pickier on eating processed foods. The wild Sulawesi shrimp colors are much nicer, I, I do notice that, and it might be because from the sun, and that's what I'm guessing and from what I've read. Uh, one of my wild caught Sulawesi tanks unfortunately are slowly dying one by one. Uh, one of them is doing quite well, so I'm not exactly too sure why. But uh, similar to fish and other shrimp, I truly believe homebred ones are usually stronger. And if you're lucky enough to have local breeders, uh, sometimes it's just a driveway to pick them up. So I'd recommend if you're starting out, go for the homebred or locally bred ones first and then move on to the wild caught ones afterwards. I do have two tanks of wild caught ones that are doing quite well. So uh, I believe that you can have success with wild caught ones. Screw up number five, uh, hardscapes and rocks. It's true that there are large stones and rocks in the Sulawesi lakes in the natural habitat and I'm guessing they're probably either inert or because there's a large body of water that offsets the leaching coming from the rocks. I've personally tried Dragonstone and Man ADA Mantin rocks with my Sulawesi shrimp and uh, they didn't do too well and they were dying and I suspect they were leaching something into the water. I'm pretty sure Dragonstone for sure because um, it's quite a soft stone and you can break it with just by touching it. Uh, next uh, Sulawesi tank, I'll be trying river stones in my setup and hopefully they're inert and they won't uh, affect the shrimps or the Sulawesi shrimps. Screw up number four, water changes. Um, I personally find that changing the water too quickly causes death and it uh, deaths because of the stress uh, of the changing parameters. When I switched to the drip method of one drip per second, uh, when I do my weekly water changes, there was probably almost barely no deaths at all. I suspect that it's because they're sensitive to the changes and the drip method works great uh, in this aspect. So I'd recommend doing weekly water changes using the drip method instead of just pouring it in uh, really quickly. Screw up number three, it's the substrate. Uh, I've been researching what type of substrates to use and I made a major mistake uh, on my second time and I tried using some old ADA Amazonia which caused the pH to drop. I did lose a few that way and I've been using inert substrates ever since. Uh, my personal preference is Seachem's Denitrate or Onyx and it's a porous uh, substrate that allows algae to grow on. Uh, so far my colleague loves the algae that's growing on it and I see them scavenging on them all the time. I believe as long as the substrate is inert, it'll work for Sulawesi shrimp. So I might be trying some of the lava rocks uh, next time. Screw up number two, 
overfeeding. There are two major mistakes I made here with overfeeding. One of them was overfeeding Glass Garden's Bacter AE. I was feeding the recommended dosage, which is I believe a scoop, and it was way too much. Uh, you'd only really need a dash every week uh, for a 10 gallon aquarium and depending on the number of shrimp that you have. Another thing that I've read about Bacter AEs is it contains, I believe, amino acids, which if I read correctly, it can cause ammonia to spike if you overdosed. Uh, ever since then, um, I dosed a little bit less and I've actually switched over to a different product, uh, which is SL Aqua's Magic Powder, and the shrimp seem to be much happier. As for overfeeding on foods, uh, whichever food you use, please take out the leftover foods after an hour. I think that's a good mark uh, to look at it. Uh, another way is to use snails. I personally use yellow rabbit snails in my Sulawesi tanks and they help eat leftover foods uh, in the tanks, causing the water, uh, so, the, so it doesn't cause the water to uh, deteriorate. So my top major number one screw up is patience. This is the key of all shrimps, but specifically the sensitive uh, Sulawesi shrimps. First of all, they need a well-aged mature aquarium with lots of biofilm. So I personally recommend 3-4 to four months, but even longer if possible, 5-6 to six months would be better. And I usually put in tester cherry shrimps to test the water to make sure they're okay. By default, Sulawesi shrimps are algae grazers and don't really need all those commercial foods and those fancy foods. They can survive on biofilm and algae, so I'd recommend letting the aquarium age, wait, and be patient and also don't add them too soon. Find a good local homebred source, drip acclimatize them, and slowly introduce them to your aquarium. I'm personally guilty of this because once I see a deal on a shrimp package, not just Sulawesi, I want to go out and buy them and put them in my tanks. Personally, I currently have four aquariums aging on my shrimp rack and I'm trying to resist every day to try to put shrimp in them, even though as much as there's some great summer deals out there. That's all for my top 10 major screw-ups that costed me the death of my Sulawesi shrimps, that cost me money, and some mental stress. These are really fascinating shrimps, and I hope to share all my experiences with everybody, uh, success and failure. I have detailed write-ups on my blog and photos on my Instagram. I really hope you enjoy the video, and if you like, leave some comments below and your experience and uh, have an amazing day and until next video.